so welcome to everybody. This is the 16th appointment of uh, the series of conference uh, called Parlando di Arte Rupestre, talking about uh, rock art that we started with the Centro Camuno uh, one year and four months ago. It was right before the COVID. Actually, we started this conference series uh, um, like uh, with real people in a real room, but right after the first conference there was COVID arrived so we decided to to transform it into an online conference series maybe we have been now there are many conference series like that maybe we are uh, among the first that did it during the the COVID today we have the great honor to have uh, Sara Garces um, which will make a presentation uh, named uh, Tagus Valley Rock Art Complex so I make a brief presentation of, uh, of Sara. So um, she uh, has an, a PhD obtained, uh, obtained at the University uh, of uh, Trasos Montes e Alto Duro, which is in Villa Real in Portugal. Uh, her thesis actually is on the Tagus Valley rock art. So you can understand that probably she's one of the person who knows the area better in the world. Um, she has a postdoc uh, fellowship in the Polytechnic Institute of uh, Tomar, uh, in the context of which she continued her research in the study of uh, the Tagus Valley rock art, and uh, also doing studies uh, on pigment analysis and other topics, of course. Uh, she has a wide range of collaborations with many institutes in the, um, uh, in the world. Uh, which is the Polytechnic Institute of Tomar, the Geosciences Center, University of Coimbra, the Earth and Memory Institute of Massau, Portugal, and Museum of Prehistoric Art in the Sacred Tagus Valley in Massau. So it's a great honor to have you, Sara Garces. Can you hear us? And yeah. are you ready to start? Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm, I, I'm very glad to be here to present uh, a the focus of uh, my work in the last few years. And I think it's always very good to present this site because nowadays most of this material is underwater, as you will see. So it's very important for us to know and, and, and to study sites that could that were once uh, extremely important in the territory, but today we cannot um, reach most of this material. Um, I will start by my sharing my 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 screen. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, and the topic is the Tagus Valley rock art. Uh, the Tagus Valley probably it's not a very known site uh, due to the um, uh, nowadays uh, position right now. Like I said, it's underwater the majority, but yet it is, uh, and it was considered when it was found in the early 70s, it was considered to be um, one of the main uh, rock art areas in, uh, in, in Iberian Peninsula, not only due to the how big this complex is. Um, it, it started to be known as a 40 kilometer um, rock art complex, but in the recent studies, uh, we are including some sites that we think that um, are typologically and chronologically um, compared with the, what is in Tagus. And we think that this territory could be as big as 120 kilometers spread of rock art. And this is what I'm going to present today. Um, so I cannot start speaking about the Tagus Valley rock art without speaking how it was discovered and what happened in that time. Because this was discovered in 1971. Actually, this year it's 50 years since its discovery. Uh, and and uh, it was discovered a little bit by chance, it was by archaeologists. Archaeologists were in the territory to do um, paleolithic work uh, in excavations. They were making prospection and they got the tip from a local ethnographer that there were written rocks in the Tagus, in the Tagus uh, bank, schist banks. 
and the e ask them to go and and see yeah, you should come and see some things that are in the in the river so actually what they found out was that between the mouth of a small river called Okreza, which is in the municipality that I'm standing now in Massão, and the border with Spain, we are literally in the center of Portugal, uh, going to the border with Spain uh, in the river, uh, they found out that there were thousands of engravings um, in these 40 kilometers. So uh, they were very shocked and, and they actually found out a gigantic uh, complex of rock art um, but there were several problems. First, there was a dam being built uh, in, in the area, and they realized that uh, as soon as the dam would start work, it would put the majority of these sites underwater. Uh, so, and we were still living in the dictatorship, so we could not actually fight to, to save the site or, or ask for many support because it wouldn't happen. What happens is that these group archaeologists, they, they get together, they, they manage a team, and in the next two years, they decide to make uh, documentation work um, as much as they could, because there was the lack of time issue too, as much as they could in these rocks. Um, and it was probably one of the most known uh, rock art works in the Portuguese archaeology um in 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 the late uh, 20th century and it was very very interesting this is the territory uh that we are talking about the mouth of okreza river it's in this confluence here on the left side um of my of my screen and along the, the tagos river until the border with spain it's a very big area this is the first area that was registered in the 70s and they found out that it was many sites that were spread along this area. Um, and it was uh, a lot of work. Uh, they got support from mainly um, Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation in Lisbon in terms of uh, money. And they actually managed in the next two years to do field work. Um, looking at the map of these sites, each uh, black dot, dot is a rock art site. Uh, and we are talking about this main area the, in the lower part of the map. Uh, and we can see three, the, the, the black uh, lines are the dams in the area. So we have three dams that actually are um, influencing all this area. We have the, the Fratel Dam that was being built right here. The, the first one that was being built in the 70s. The one in the, the, the tributary river in the Ocreza was already built. And in the border with Spain, there's another dam. So what happens is that uh, this complex of rock art is in the middle of two dams. The majority, well, the majority of the rocks are in the middle of two dams. So it would be lost. Um, and they were very concerned with this fact. Uh, and even today, it's, uh, we could consider that everything is lost, but today we can visit or visit some rocks in three, three sites. The Ocreza River, the first one here, it's actually the only site that is prepared for visitation. Uh, here in the municipality where I'm standing now, where I live in Massa municipality, they are the responsible responsible for the Ocreza rock art. There's a museum and there's a plan um, of visitation of the remaining rocks that we still have outside water. One of them is a very important rock because it's the only uh, Paleolithic uh, art rock that there is in the entire Tagus. It was found uh, only in the year 2000, it was really late um, considering the, 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 the work uh, in the Tagus in the 70s. They found it in the in 2000. After that one, the more rock art was found in Ocreza. Um, and it actually opened a little bit our idea about how uh, complex and how much typology and the big chronology that Tagus rock art uh, had. Uh, the other two sites, they still have some rocks uh, remaining outside water, depending on the level of the river. So it's the type of sites that, that we can visit 
depending on the time of the year, depending on the level of the river. Um, but they are normally difficult sites to, to access. So in the 70s, they found that rock art, there are many news that come uh, in the news um, about it, mainly to say that it's going to drown. And there is nothing to do because the dam is already being, being built, sorry. Um, so what happens to this team? The team decides that it, they have to implement a system the, of recording the rock art that uh, is fast, is well done, and could be uh, studied, could be used later, because there was no time to study in that time. That was time to record and nothing else. So they made a, a, a very well organized field work um, and they, they decided to talk with some French colleagues regarding the methodology to record the rocks. So they decided to use the molding technique. So they decided to make uh, latex molds of the surface of the rocks, which consists in using uh, liquid latex, a rubber, it's a kind of liquid rubber that they would put in the rock in different layers. And in the middle, they would put a gas layer another layers of latex. And when it was dried, they could take it in the, from the surface of the rock and everything that was marked in the rock, all the engravings, the fractures, the, the, everything that was in the surface of the rock would be on the mold. So this is, um, it was a technique that was being used in the time. It was considered to be extremely re reliable taking into account the conditions of Tagus in the 70s, of course. Um, and they actually managed to do uh, almost 1,500 molds of rock art. So we have the record of 1,500 rocks in Tagus made with this, uh, with this technique. Also, they, the team managed to do the photography record, uh, the field sheets record, everything that is um, archaeological field work basics. Uh, but the main material actually was this collection of, of the modes. Uh, they also made uh, signposting, numbering of the rocks, everything. It was a very organized team and it worked for the next two years until 1974, when the dam starts to rise the, the water and submerged more than 99% of the, the rock art that the, existed there. In the following publications, the people that were, and the colleagues and the archaeologists that were in the field in the 70s say that they obviously didn't have time to do everything. So what we know now, and we have the record of 7,000 engravings, we know that it probably would be much more. Um, there are a list that one of the colleagues published a few years ago that uh, it gives the record of at least 30 sites of rock art spread in the Tagus, but they could only have the record of 12 of them, 12, uh, more or less 12. So we know that the Tagus will be much more um, richer in terms of uh, amount of engravings. So this is the result of that work. This is a, uh, an example of a mold, and we can see a snake-shaped figure uh, along with the fractures of the rock uh, and um, the shape of the rock. Sometimes we don't have the shape of the rock itself. We have the shape of the panel, um, but most of them, and the majority of them, there is a record number that records not only the site, the rock number, but also the number of the mold. So everything, we, we have a very good understanding of how many sites there were, how many rocks there were. And even if they divided two things into panels, uh, we can today understand and make the, um, the collection of certain panels that would give an entire rock. Um, this is a little Sorry. bit- Sarah, we just for clarification, we saw three figures of the snake. Is that the same uh, uh, mold with different lights? Is it that? Uh, 
Yes, yes, it's the same mode okay. with different lights. Yes, okay, perfect. Uh, the perfect. the the photography work of the molds that we did uh, also, we had to we had in consideration exactly that to make the um, nowadays if you want to make the record using plastic sheets for example of this of this material you have to stand in a a, a, a dark room with artificial light. And you will, you will see that you have to move a lot with the light so you can see all the details. So when we've made the photography work on the, on the molds, we had that, in, that into consideration. So we had all the molds have photographies from different standing points of light. So we can see everything. And this is a very good example. It's the same figure, but you have different levels of um, uh, details according to the light position, which is very important in this case. Yeah. So here a little bit more examples. Uh, some of them were really small. Some of them were really big. So uh, the amount and the different complexity of these molds were quite different. Um, and it also depended, of course, who did, the, who did the molds, how was the conditions of the day in that day, if it was raining or not, if they dried the faster or not, even the amount of product that they had, uh, it all influenced in this material. But generally speaking, it's, it's a great collection. It's an amazing collection of, of Targus uh, uh, molds. And, and we managed to do a lot of work with this material. So uh, in 2009, uh, 2008, 2009, we had a project called Hoop Teju. Uh, it's literally like rock art of Tagus, Hoop Teju. Um, and we started, we wanted to make a, a better uh, study on the Okereza rock art, but we could not study one site without uh, taking into consideration that Okereza was one site from a very big complex. So for many years, these molds were not, they were not studied uh, as a whole. They, there were Mm, some monographic studies, some rocks were a little bit important. There were some publications from colleagues uh, in terms of monographic studies, small articles mainly, but we didn't have a corpus of the rock art of Tagus. Uh, in 2010, uh, a colleague that was in the 70s in Tagus actually, uh, did his PhD thesis on Tagus rock art um, but uh, he decided to publish uh, not the entire collection, a part, a big part of the rock art of Tagos, which was a very big um, help in our work because he, the, it was the person who had the photographies from the 70s of the rocks, of the landscape, uh, uh, which would never been published before. So it actually gave us a lot of help um, in, in our own work. So in the Rupu Teju project, one of the main goals was to make the 2D tracing and the photography of as much molds as we could find. And they were all stored in the, in the Koa Valley, uh, uh, in the institute there. And they, were, they came to Massau and for during four years, more or less, the team here in Massau were making the tracing of these molds. And we decided to go um, in several ways. We couldn't just choose one way because it could go wrong. So we chose several ways of tracing. We started by doing the two dimension tracing of this material using the plastic sheet uh, uh, method that we all know in Volca Monica um, applied to this material in, in particular. So we had to use a lot of artificial light in dark rooms, we had to adapt to this material in particular. And it helped actually a lot to train um, some generations of students of archaeology that were in Massão, uh, because in Massão we have a master degree in archaeology and rock art running here. And a lot of the lab work that the students were doing were actually do doing the training uh, in rock art with these molds. So it was a very big team that helped a lot. And we managed to do the tracings of, of the molds that were in the collection of COA. We also have um, field work in the remaining rock art sites. 
So there are th those three sites that I said that remain um, with rock art uh, outside water. Uh, we, we ask permission to go to those sites and make our own field work. And it was very important also for the um, landscape part, the landscape interpretation of the, the sites. It helped a lot to have an insight um, view of how these sites were, were located. They were spread along in a very big territory and even the differences between these three different uh, sites. Um, then the big part uh, of, of digital work, uh, it, we, we had to work in all, well, to prepare and to organize all this material digitally. Uh, and many of these molds actually coming together were an entire rock. So that there are a lot of um, interesting uh, issues regarding the molds itself because Many of them were just panels of one entire rock. So with the photographies that were published, we managed to actually understand uh, many rocks that were uh, considered to be um, a unit. Um, and, and also this was very important to understand actually also the overlappings of the figures. Not only to look at the figure from the top and have a general look of everything that was there, but also to organize the tagos considering the typology, the number of figures and the superimposition of figures, which, is, which was very helpful to um, when we started to work on the chronology of the tagos. Uh, this is some examples of what I said. Uh, there are many, there are many uh, superimpositions in tagos that have to be considered, uh, especially when the difference in chronology could be very smooth or it looked like to be very smooth, but actually Tagos give us a very good spectrum um, of, uh, of the chronology of engravings. And we can see that uh, a lot uh, through the superimposition of figures, for example, or association of figures from different spectrum of typology, which is also very um, interesting. Associations between images also give us some interesting information. And obviously we could not um, rule out everything that has been published before uh, our work. So every, there were a lot uh, of important information that had been published regarding the methodology in the field, regarding some uh, detail aspects, uh, regarding some rocks and the monographic aspects of some rocks were very helpful uh, so we considered everything, even some rocks that were published before, but we didn't have access for of the molds for whatever reason. But um, there are things that were published, but we didn't have access uh, in real. So we put everything in our uh, in our corpuses, um, and that was also a very big part of understanding the Tagus has a, a, an entire site, an entire valley. And what is the, the advantage of and having the opportunity to study uh, a big site in, in all uh, dimensions? So we have access to all figures, we can count them, we can see the typology, we can see the overlappings, the associations, and have it in one place, make us see uh, things that probably we couldn't understand if we're only dealing with pieces of information. For example, uh, we could see differences uh, in the technique of making the engravings. Uh, the majority are packing engravings, but there are some very interesting and rare um, scratched figures. Um, and we can actually manage to locate them in the, in, in the whole tagos. And also we could manage to see differences in the packing. So images were being made in a different way uh, using the same technique, but inside the same technique, it, there were different ways of being uh, made. And that was also very important. Sometimes, and because of uh, information that was being published before, uh, authors always said to pay attention to um, the packing, the type of packing, and they were considering 
the biggest and deepest packing to be the oldest figures. And in this case, uh, we, we paid attention a lot to these kind of details and it also helped a lot with the chronology because it was coming in a sense that oldest figures, the figures that we were considered to be the oldest were being more um, deep um, and, and, and having a, a very uh, deep packing than other figures. Um, and this is only possible again, when we look to an entire uh, set of information um, and we start considering details that before we wouldn't. So in general terms, Tagus uh, um, uh, has now uh, 12 sites that uh, are uh, recorded, are documented, and they it came up uh, with uh, almost uh, 7,000 engravings spread along 1,636 rocks. And the ma big majority of this rock art uh, is uh, what we call or what is known in the Iberian Peninsula as schematic rock art. Schematic rock art, uh, it's a very uh, complex, uh, very varied type of rock art that we know now that go, starts in the early Neolithic and it can go until the Bronze Age. And there is a very big variety of, of images. It can be both engraved and painted. There are thousands of shelters in, in both Portugal and Spain with schematic art. It's very well published, uh, probably mainly in Portuguese and Spanish, but as well, at least in these two languages, it's well published. Um, the, the, the main characteristics, and if we think in the early works of uh, Henri Braille in the Iberian Peninsula, we probably will know exactly uh, that his first works were uh, about the, the schematic rock art shelters in Portugal and Spain. We find this also in the banks of rivers, and probably in this area, we can stand with the Tagus Valley rock art and the Guadiana rock art, which also is another site that is underwater because of a dam. But when they found it, also a very big collection of schematic art engraved in, in, in river. Um, regarding Tagus, we have a big variety. We have a lot of anthropomorphic figures, animal figures, the big majority is what we call geometrics and abstract figures, things that we cannot understand, sometimes the shape or the form, but mainly the, the meaning, circles, concentric circles, spirals, lines, dots, uh, a very big variety of circles. So not just the circle itself, but a very variety of um, different uh, kind of ways of making a circle. Uh, we can see it a lot. We have shields, objects, sun-shaped figures, um, things that we cannot understand well what it means or what was represented. Packing stains also a lot, some indeterminate figures and very, very few inscriptions, modern inscriptions, Roman inscriptions, and just two religious figures, which is very funny because I think it's the two of them, or at least one of them is from a priest that saw the engravings in the 18th century and decided to leave his name and the date of his visit to Tagus, which is very helpful because we know exactly when he was there. <laughs> um, but the, he saw them most probably and he decided to make exactly the same for him. Um, so this is the overall of what is Tagus. In the details, we managed to create this chronology, uh, and this was actually the big part. The documentation work that we did helped a lot um, then in, the, in, in this part of actually make a chronological map of Tagus, and it was not very easy because it was 7,000 engravings that we had to check and compare to, to be completely sure, or at least this is a suggestion, an interpretation, a proposal of a chronology for, for Tagus. And the biggest part that was obvious, it, it was that there was a lot of schematic art, but yet there was a work uh, that has been done, for example, uh, 
um, along with many uh, Spanish colleagues, but I've, I've followed a lot the work of um, my colleagues Hipólito Collado and José Julio García Ranz. Hipólito Collado was my co-supervisor of the Tagus, and he works a lot in the painted, also engraved, but painted schematic art in Extremadura uh, area in Spain. And they are making a big effort to try to understand uh, the divisions inside the schematic art. What came first? What is the earliest figures that appear? What uh, are, uh, can be compared with the Calcolithic or Bronze Age uh, material? Um, so it, it's a little bit harder because um, it's a, a type of rock art that we cannot very well compare with many things, but we do have things to compare, especially um, in the archaeological context. Ceramics, um, mainly a lot of ceramics, and then later uh, from Bronze Age um, material and, and in the stelae, or in, even in megalithic rock art, we can compare a lot. Um, and from these comparisons, we created this uh, structure uh, that I think it is important to better understand what's going on in Tagus the, in the last 10,000, 12,000 years old. Um, so the big majority of rock art is from the schematic rock art. We know these days that it started, uh, it probably starts in the early Neolithic. Um, and uh, goes all through Cacolithic and Bronze in, and Bronze Age. And it is characterized by schematic rock art. The name says it a lot. It's a lot of schematic figures, very standing figures. There are no movement in these figures. It's very well characterized in the Iberian Peninsula. And it's the type of figures that we find the same type, the same uh, shape in many, many places. Um, so it's a very standard uh, figures that can be found um, in all over Iberian Peninsula, at least in, in uh, different techniques, both engraved and, and painted, as I said. So it was very um, normal for me to compare with all other techniques. In this case, we can see here that in anthropomorphic figures, the big majority are schematic, and we have a very big variety of this type of um, um, human figures. And in this case, we could find literally uh, a place to compare with the engravings somewhere, for example, in Spain. Uh, in this case, I found uh, besides Guadiana and all over Extremadura, I could find uh, comparison for the engravings of schematic art of Tagus all over uh, Spain, for example. In this case, I will give you two examples. The first ones, everything that is in black is engravings from Tagus, and we can compare them with a shelter called Cueva del Sol, which is in Andalusia, which is south of Spain. And the majority of my fears I could actually compare with the park, National Park of Monfragua uh, in Extremadura area in Spain. Animal figures are probably a little bit um, harder to understand, not from the point of the animal itself, uh, but the species normally is very hard to understand. We know it is an animal, considering the body, four legs. Uh, sometimes, rarely, you can have some details, like the antlers or the horns. But in schematic art, animals are extremely, extremely standard and it becomes very schematic. So we know it's an animal, it's a zoo or morph, the shape of an animal, but many times we don't know exactly what it is. Uh, but I found very good uh, um, um, examples uh, in, painted, uh, in painted sites and sometimes the uh, amount of similarity, it's unbelievable the paintings and engravings can be exactly or almost the same. The only thing that changes is the technique. So there's a family resemblance in all schematic rock art. Despite if it's different techniques, we know exactly what, what it is and we can have very good comparison and have exactly the same type of figure in many, many places. Um, some other figures that also 
uh, here, uh, it's, we call it, actually this name comes from <clears throat> Hippolyto Collado Physis, which he calls open structures. Open structures is figures that are not closed. It's not a circle or a concentric circle or a spiral, but is uh, lines, curved lines, wavy lines, um, angle shape figures. Um, many of them are as a, a unit, like a set of different figures come making one, um, one figure in particular. And lines, it's a very uh, common figure in schematic rock art. We can find it probably, if not in all painted shelters in the Iberian Peninsula, probably <laughs> it could be uh, almost this because lines, it's a very common figure um, all over this territory. And it's very funny to find it also engraved um, and in the different shapes. So all this was considered, and for example, we could compare them with the um, ceramic decoration uh, that uh, occurs in the early Neolithic. And we uh, consider some of these images, the curvy and wavy lines to be uh, the, the first ones to be um, represented in the schematic art. Here are some examples of shelters. Uh, Friso del Terror, it's a very famous shelter in Extremadura because it's very in a very dangerous uh, and horrible place to access. And it only has lines, it's unbelievable. Uh, so it's, a, it's very easy to, to compare these two techniques. And then uh, we can also have a very different typology inside one figure. So if we have spirals, we have spirals with two curves, three curves, four curves. So we have a lot of different typologies inside one figure itself. Um, and Tagus is very, very uh, diverse in this sense. It, it's very rare to have like a figure that only appears once or it only appears in one, in, in, in one way. Um, and, and this gives uh, the, uh, the idea of a very chaotic rock. If we see a rock with all the figures, it looks like that is chaos, but there are actually uh, a lot of standard figures there that could be uh, meaning a lot of things. Uh, and when we start to dissect one by one, we can start to see that the variety of tagos is amazing. And here's some uh, other examples um, of different types of uh, spirals, for example, or circles. The amount of circles that Tagus has and inside the circle figure, the differences, it's amazing. It could be a catalog only about circles, how to make a circle one by one, <laughs> the basics of Tagus. Um, and it's, it's very funny because the circle, it's the most, drawn figure so um and it's also common in other in other um in other contexts but especially in the rivers when we have schematic rock art we can see a lot of circles uh and in guadiana for example there is a part only regarding the circle figures it's also like a very big catalog of different ways of they doing circles tagus and guadiana have a very family resemble thing they are very, very common. We could see any rock art of Guadiana and we say that's Tagus or the opposite. Um, and, and, and even the geography uh, could be resembled. Uh, and this is one of the few things that is really interesting in, in Tagus. So a little bit more examples and sun-shaped figures. And the sun-shaped figures, it's, uh, it's very, they are not many but they are important, but they normally are very well identified. They are really a sun-shaped figure. Uh, and we can even find one or two examples that come from with the comparison with megalithic art. This is one example that the figure from a uh, Cromlech in the south of Portugal, it's exactly uh, the same that we can find in the rock art in the rock of Tagus. So this also helps us a lot with the chronology part. Um, and, and the sun-shaped figure, it's very, um, 
interesting because we have the example of three animals that uh, I think they are deer, uh, most sure, because the handlers of the deer eventually were closed to make the shape of a sun shape. So the handlers were made in a very round way. And when they were closed in one of the, one of these examples, I will show you later, we can actually see in the rock because it's outside water that somebody went there after and closed the circle of the handlers. And the handler closed gives the idea of a sun-shaped figure. So this transformation of a symbol to another one, uh, it's actually rare. It happens in three figures in the tagus, but we could uh, see these differences and, and gives a lot of significance to these actions. This Very is interesting. The, so, do you uh, so do you think it refers to a mythology, to uh, some ritual, some uh, belief about the the sun? Uh, yes, it could be. It could be in one in that example that I gave of the where we can actually see that it was closed. It's very funny because it's a figure. I think I have it somewhere here. I will show you. Uh, it's a figure of a human person, a human being holding a dead deer in the back, like a dead deer is in the in the back, and then the head of the deer is uh, hanging, and so, and the handlers are surrounded, and then we can see that somebody went and did a packing to, to close the, the, handler, the, the handlers. And if you don't consider the sun shape, only the figure of the human with the deer, I would say this is really, really old. Not only because of the movement of the anthropomorphic figure, because schematic rock art, you saw the anthropomorphic figure. You know, it's like very, very straight. Uh, so looking at the animal and the human figure, I would say this is a really old, figure uh, but then somebody adapted so the sun uh, which we consider to be uh, later a neolithic uh, uh, period figure comes after so in in this case they were adapting adapting and changing the meaning probably uh, or adding meaning it could be a, a case of that but the um, but we can see that with the sun shapes in three animals, which is very interesting. Um, so I believe it came, uh, at least in one figure, I can say it came after, after the engraving, they closed the handlers. The other ones, uh, it could be the same case, but the handlers are closed in the, uh, in, on purpose. And so it's not um, a one, one time thing. It's even rare, but it happens in three different sites. Uh, and it could be an adaption to a myth or, or, or adding a myth to the, to the story of their rock, for example. Sun-shaped figures in schematic rock art are very interesting. It occurs quite common. There are several shelters in Spain that are called Shelter of the Sun, Cueva del Sol, um, because they are um, very common and actually, uh, I think I have it here. Yeah, I received this week <laughs> a book about the sun shaped figures uh, in schematic art in Spain. Actually, it was I was I was talking to you and thinking I think I got a book on this exactly. So this is a, one of the a very good contribution to this theme. Um, a coincidence. <laughs> it was I, I it, it was still in my backpack. They did. Uh, Ippolito gave me and it was still here. Um, but it is considered a very important uh, figure in the, um, in, 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 in the schematic art. Uh, and obviously we all think again, uh, very easily in the myth, uh, in the, everything that the people that did this were thinking and were feeling. And obviously regarding to uh, the sun shape, uh, it's always very, very important. So. There are um, new publications about this. It's called Sun Shaped Figures uh, in the Rock Art of Extremadura. And I'm pretty sure it's online for download, probably in Hippolito Collado Research Gate or Academia, uh, most probably. So this is a very important theme within uh, schematic rock art. And it was very, very easy to compare these sites with, uh, with the tables. Then we have a group of figures 
that are quite uncommon, uh, like the bow. In, in Tagus, it depends on how you read it, of course. I put it in horizontal, this two triangle uh, shape. But if we put it in the vertical, for example, like there is in the La Calderita shelter in Spain, they are considered human figures because there are human figures that are two triangulars with uh, arms and, and legs. Um, because in Tagos, we don't have the details of the human figure, the arms and legs to help us. Um, and actually in the rock, we cannot see if it's, how can we read the, the, the figure itself? I consider it as one figure um, per se, uh, like a bow tie figure, two triangle, bi-triangular, I think I call it bi-triangular and it occurs um, not many times, but occurs also in Tagus. Then we have things like this combination of two circles in a, linked with a line uh, that are quite rare, um, but this is only to show you the diversity of Tagu, which is amazing. And then we have this group of figures of footprints also, and instruments, objects, V-shape, V-shape uh, shields that are very easy to find in the archaeological context and the representations of the stelae of the South Iberian. And these faces or masks, uh, I don't know very well what to, to call it, but it resembles me a face or a mask. Um, um, Somebody would call it an alien, of course, an extraterrestrial, but uh, let's leave it aside. I didn't want to go that way, <laughs> but yes, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'm sorry, I already interrupted you. The, the figure that is on the left of the foot, uh, you know, we have uh, some of them in Balcamonica, and that is for this is um, from the medieval time actually, and it's for hanging. I don't know the name in English, for hanging people, you know, for for killing people. But it's from the, the medieval time. Uh, it's it's very similar, but I don't think this is the case. Well, actually, this is the only figure like this in Tagus. In all Tagus, there's this one figure. I call it an instrument but because it looks something that you use on something. Um, but actually, I couldn't find anything that would resemble this. So uh, that would be even interesting to see what the engravings of Vaca Monica to see if it makes sense in the Tagus or not. Um, this figure, uh, long shape figure here, I compared some of this with some figures that appeared in Campo Lameiro in uh, Galicia rock art in engravings. It's not exactly the same, but it resembles the what they call it, uh, idoliform, like idol shape uh, figure, uh, something that would resemble a human being or a entity, but it's not very well clear. We have a few uh sh footprints we also have um a few and then we have this collection of we have some figures like this face that actually resembles the face of something or a mask uh there are also half a dozen of these uh, figures that are very very interesting and then the religious uh figures are very rare and um a small group of um, numbers, um, inscriptions, uh, modern Romans um, that are not very, very, that are not very uh, typical of Tagus either. They appear very scarce. So this is what we could uh, give a big glimpse, obviously, of the schematic art. Uh, if then, who is a little bit more interested in this theme, I comp we managed to compare probably almost all of the figures, not all of the figures one by one, because, for example, a certain anthropomorphic figure, I have 20 or 25, but every shape we managed to compare with other sites uh, to make sure, uh, to, to make a strong chronology for Tagus. And that gave a very good, uh, very good result because we could see more and more resembles with many other sites and be sure of the chronology. But there is a face in, 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 in Tagus rock art that is very interesting. Uh, 
um, some years ago, some authors started to speak about the possibility of a face in the rock art of Iberian Peninsula. I'm talking about Iberian Peninsula, but this could be anywhere. But in Iberian Peninsula, mainly, the Paleolithic art is very well um, known, organized. There are a lot of, of, of studies uh, regarding that. The schematic rock art also, but not in between. What happens in the Mesolithic times? Uh, and it was not very clear. Uh, and some years ago, some authors started to give some uh, glances of things that could be considered not Paleolithic and then not uh, schematic or Neolithic rock art or anything like that. Uh, and even it started with some things, for example, that are publications in Sega Verde. Um, there are some sites that are could be considered, but very always very not many publications about that. Uh, until the, that, uh, also the colleagues from Extremadura started to notice in the schematic sites that they had figures that were below the schematic rock art that could not resemble with schematic rock art, and they were not for sure, Paleolithic art. So there was something in between that could be uh, emerging and it needed our attention. Um, for example, in this, in this panel that I'm showing you now, it's the human figure with the dead deer. In red, it's the part that was closed the antlers, which is very interesting because in the rock itself, you can actually see that it's not linear. Somebody came after and made uh, a packing to to close the 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 the, engra the engraving. Okay. Yeah, it's very very good. And um, so this tendency started to be called, especially from Hippolito and Jose Julio Garcia Hans, a pre schematic rock art. Th there is here obviously uh, a lot of difficulties to say exactly of what chronology it is: Mesolithic, Epipaleolithic. What is the culture? What is the chronology? Uh, so it was considered pre-schematic because there is no idea or we cannot yet say for sure exactly where that rock art stands in the chronology, but it came before the schematic. And there are some publications um, that started to appear with a glance of the series in 1999 from Husso, other authors also in Ciaga Verde, like Primitiva Bueno Ramirez in 2009, they called it style five. Uh, that was the discussion of the late stage of the Paleolithic art, if it was still Paleolithic or not, or if it was something else. And they, some authors were already giving us a slight um, ideas of that. Animals uh, have a certain anatomic details, but not in the head, for example. The, the legs are very, very simple. There are something in the structure of the body of the animal. So some authors started to work on this question. Um, even before in Spain, Antonio Beltran, which is a very famous rock art researcher and archeologist in 1989, specified uh, some arguments to point that there was no rupture obviously between Paleolithic and Neolithic times in rock art. They did, just didn't stop making rock art, but it was not easy to actually see uh, what was in the between because everybody was very focused either in Paleolithic art or in the schematic art. Uh, and, and we know that today, many things that were being said to be schematic because I don't know if it was easier, but now schematic rock art is very well uh, characterized. There's a very specific way of the schematic rock art being done, uh, and many things started to emerge under this, this rock art. Also in 2003, the five criteria that gave by the, uh, this author helped to characterize what could be in between uh, in the Mesolithic times. Um, in the study of the Guadiana Valley, um, there are the Portuguese side and the Spanish side. The Spanish side was the thesis of Hippolito, and he already starts by giving uh, 
give, saying that there are a lot of superimpositions of the schematic art over a type of animals and, and a type of rock art that didn't resemble with the schematic art. And also in the, in the, in the works of the National Park of Monfragua in Cáceres, something started to appear also in the painting form. So shelters that were having schematic art painted were uh, showing animals, <clears throat> always animals, uh, that were being represented under this schematic art. So putting all uh, these, these works together, some publications started to appear that uh, gave some, um, I didn't want to say proofs because there are no proofs, some interpretations, some glances of the theory that we should start thinking of the initial phase uh, of the schematic art and what was before uh, the schematic art that was not Paleolithic art. So there are a couple, um, a couple, three, four uh, works that were published um, a few years ago regarding this theme. And when I was looking at Tagus, I was having exactly the same, uh, the same uh, issue. Uh, some authors, even in 1989 already about Tagus have published that they could see really old animals, horses, deers mainly, but in a very specific rock, the rock 155 of the site of Fratel that has a monography work uh, published in 1981. Uh, we can see obviously that those animals are not schematic for sure, but not, they are not yet exactly what we would consider Paleolithic art, because then there was a lot of studies on Paleolithic art and we can see that they don't resemble with, the, with this kind of art. So there was also this glimpse of work in Tagus. Uh, they said it's a very old rock art, we probably happy Paleolithic rock art, they are not from the schematic times, but they were not very um, they didn't develop much the theme, but I was taking into consideration this. And this rock art, the 155, is particularly rich in this kind of animals. But it's very funny because in this rock art, in this rock specifically, there's animals that are overlapping a spiral. And I was intrigued. Okay, something is wrong here. Are the spirals older than we think or no? They were considered schematic art, but we have these very old animals in the top of the spiral. And then in the publications, the earliest publications of Tagus, there were some notes from the people that were in Tagus in the, in the 70s. And talking about this rock specifically, they said that they could see, not in, only in this rock, but in other rocks with old animals, the ones that resembled with the Paleolithic ones, that the pecking was really, really deep. So it looks like that, especially for deer, because this only happens with deer, in two rocks that have these old deer figures, there are spirals. And even if we consider the spirals came after in schematic times, Neolithic, Acolithic, whatever, they were re-pecking still the animals. And this was possible to see in the field. And the archaeologists from the 70s wrote down this information. And we actually can see this in two figures. So there are two examples of animals that are really considered to be the oldest ones in Tagos that have spirals or circles under the handlers or under the body. But in both cases, they say the animals, the deer specifically, was being repacked over and over which is very, very uh, incredible if we think, because the deer uh, has always stand up as a very important animal in Tagus. And is this kind of details that gives me a very strong feeling that uh, there was something going on exactly with the figure of the deer. Because the other animals, they were not uh, pecked again. From what I could consider, no. I could see these examples in these two figures. Uh, and the deer is the most represented animal in Tagus, and it has a very strong connotation with this Mesolithic face. 
okay so hunter gather uh, mindset still and very strong uh, and very focused on um, on engraving deers in specific um so considering all our studies in Tagos, uh, we started to consider that a big number of animal representations actually was um, in a chronological cycle that was made before the schematic art. The shape of the uh, bodies, the shape of the handlers, the way they were being represented had absolutely nothing to do with the schematic art uh, and were not connected also with Paleolithic art. Uh, and many of these animals were actually standing in a, open, in a superimposition level with the figures from the schematic times. These are some diff examples of animals that we are considered to be the oldest. The details that they present in the body, the lines in the middle of the body, the S, more or less very smooth S shape of the bodies, for example, here. Um, the fact that some of them present movement, which in the schematic art is absolutely doesn't appear, it's not possible. The fact that some of them present arrows stuck in the body. It's very funny because you don't have the, anim the human figure, but the human is there because, uh, uh, in representation through the spears. Um, Idea. Exactly. Uh, but the details of the bodies, uh, the lines, the divisions of the bodies, like you saw in the rock 155, like here, all these animals have this uh, net division inside the bodies. Um, and also a lot of work with the superimpositions uh, uh, in Tagus. We have a lot of examples of schematic figures that are overlapping, even if sometimes it's just a little bit. The superimposition sometimes very subtle, but it's there. Um, and this is the case, the first figure here, the first, the, the, uh, it's the case of the deer that has a spiral under the handler, as you can see, even if it has circles in the top of it. So this is the second example that I found. Um, uh, I think there are two or three examples of animals that are repacked over time, uh, even after schematic art was, was there. And more examples. Overlappings are a very big, uh, there are several examples in Tagus. Sometimes they are very subtle, but they are there. If we analyze carefully, uh, we will find out that the uh, majority or a big, big, many animals that are uh, overlapped by schematic art. And then here starts the comparison. I cannot stop comparing with the shape and, and with other sides to give me a glimpse of what I'm looking in Tagus. And there are many sh shapes in Tagus that have a very familiar resemble, resemblance with figures, for example, from Coa Valley. There are many figures these days in Koa that are being rethought the chronology. Many things that were considered late Paleolithic. Some colleagues, I've seen some presentations and discussions of colleagues that many things could be actually Mesolithic and not um, late Upper Paleolithic, which is very, very interesting to start this discussion because it goes exactly uh, in the same direction that I'm thinking that Tagus uh, is. And I start to compare some parts of these animals. And in Paleolithic uh, figures, we know that there are many details in the body that gives us a lot of information and sometimes even chronological information. And I start to see some uh, similarities between animals of Tagus and animals in Koa. Uh, for example, these ones in below, the right one is Tagus and you can see details in the legs and the movement of looking behind that we can see also in Koa. We have several figures of deer that only the head is represented. Um, and in Koa, that's also a very specific characteristic of some deer figures, especially in Penascosa. Um, some goats that have a very specific way of drawing the, the body, I could see similarities, I'm not saying exactly the same, obviously, but similarities 
and the deer from Tagus that has some strong similarities to with the body of uh, actually dated figures from uh, Ojo Guareña cave in Spain. It's uh, a black figures that were actually C14 dated um, and they came up as early Mesolithic uh, dated. Um, I could see resemblings in many other sites. The figures that are overlapped in the Spain uh, shelters of the uh, of Hippolyto, and then a very well. Some some people could say I could be exaggerating or not, but actually I can see many resemble things with a style that happens in the um, east part of Iberian Peninsula called Levantine rock art. I don't know if you ever heard about Levantine rock art. It's a very specific uh, style that. Uh, happens in the, the Levantine area of, the, of Spain. Uh, it has very uh, strong characteristics, very typical characteristics, but a lot of movement, a lot of animals, a lot of hunting scenes. Uh, there are a big discussion still about the chronology, um, if it's only Mesolithic or not, if it's already in the Mesolithic times, it's both. There's a lot of uh, discussion on the chronology, but I found out uh, a lot of um, similarities too with some animals in Tagus, in the shape of the animals, in the way they are organized. Uh, and many times the problem of uh, talking about the chronologies uh, and comparing rock art is the problem of people giving geographic names to rock art. If we say Ge Levantine rock art, we cannot think of that type of rock art outside that area, but it could actually happen. Um, but it's a big problem in many times, not only give chronological terms to rock art, geographic terms to rock art, it's, it's a discussion that uh, is being made too, and it, it has to be um, more emphasized. But I saw many resembling um, of figures of Tagus, uh, and uh, and I know there are these kind of figures painted in shelters in in Spain um, that could be considered also really really old, and and then I did something very uh, it was fun to because I noticed that these figures had things that in schematic art that never happens, which is movement, and I tried to compare with actually. Uh, animals and and the behavior of animals regarding the 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 study that I did for the deer figures it was very funny because I had to study a little bit about the behavior of the deer to understand a lot of things that were going on on Tagus how they were organizing that figure in particular um, and that study helped me to say yes I believe that this animal is being really uh, they were paying attention more to this animal than probably other one. I don't know if he, they were eating it as represented. They were representing what they were eating more or not. The archaeological context, um, it's a little bit confusing, but I think in Mesolithic times, yes. Uh, but in any case, in the symbolic point of view, uh, they were paying attention to this animal and paying attention to the behavior and the way they represented it was also very funny. Regarding the anthropomorphic figures of this time, it's very difficult. Uh, we could say that there are no anthropomorphic figures because it's, uh, it's very rare, which actually it is, but there are this set of anthropomorphic figures in Tagus that don't match with anything that is supposed to be a schematic rock art. And sometimes this also um, appears uh, in uh, overlappings, but I believe these probably were the first anthropomorphic figures to be represented in Tagus. The chronology, it's very hard to say. We can point some comparisons, comparisons to the Alineolithic um, period, comparing with macroschematic art, with pebbles that were dated from the early Neolithic in Spain, with early Neolithic ceramic. Uh, we did a lot of comparison of these, time, of these um, examples, but this is as much as we can go now. I can say, uh, and being a little bit sure about that, they are the oldest uh, anthropomorphic figures in Tagus. I cannot say yet 
from exactly which time they are, but I can say there are very good terms to compare with uh, early Neolithic uh, material that was actually dated and it's in excavation uh, records. Um, but they are also very, very strange and completely different from all the schematic uh, output of anthropomorphic figures in Tagus. So <clears throat> there are this group, which is not much, uh, not a very big amount of animals of the pre-schematic uh, phase. If we consider that there are 7,000 figures that we have in records and we could, we could um, point that around 150 animals could be from a previous uh, chronological phase. They are not much, but yet they are actually pretty important. Um, not only because there is the, the, the question of why the animal, the, the deer figure here stands out as the important animal uh, in the symbolic framework of, of those peoples, uh, but also because it actually starts a debate on a certain type of rock art that uh, I think in the future will be uh, one of the big debates in rock art in Iberian Peninsula. So start to, to pay more attention to a specific chronological period that has never been um, very well studied or, or developed. Um, there are three sites that in Tago stand out as the most complex. When I say most complex also, because they have the biggest amount of rocks in one area, okay? So, and after this work, it was very funny because all everybody, because there was no corpuses of rock art, there was no big view uh, of the entire site. Um, it was believed that Fratel, which is a very important site, was the site with most of the rocks uh, combined in Tagus. And we actually found out that no, it was not Fratel, it was another site that looked like more dispersed, but had more figures than any of the other sites. Uh, and, these, and these three sites that have more uh, figures in Targos, uh, the topography name, it's very funny because the three of them are called Cachão. Cachão de São Simão, Cachão do Boi, e Cachão do Algarve. Cachão in Portugal, in the topography, means the part of the river that is most dangerous. There are more rapids, the water is very dangerous. Uh, so, and it's the, in the, these topographic names that we have more concentration of rock art. So this is also what I want to develop a little bit in the future, which is to uh, take in all this information, which is a lot now, and start to point it also in the landscape studies because the distribution of the sites, the distribution of the figures, I think they are very well connected with the topographic and geographic um, assets in the, last, in, the, in the landscape. And I think this could be a very good study in the future uh, because Tagos is giving me some very um, interesting information about, about this. And to end my presentation, this is the only Paleolithic art figure that we have in all Tagos. It's located in the Ocreza River. It's visitable. If you wish to visit the Rock Art Museum of Tagos, of Massaun, we can make a visit to, to this site. But it's indeed the only one figure that uh, it's of the Paleolithic characteristics. Um, we are yet to try to find if it's lack of uh, finding more, of they existed and disappeared, or if yet, uh, or if it, it is on purpose, if it's only one and that's it. We cannot answer that now. Uh, I hope we can answer that in the future. Um, for those who are interested, the corpus of the Rock Art of Tagos is published and available online in this website, institutoterramemoria.org. In the publications part, uh, you can find the entire corpus uh, with the, the 7,000 engravings. And if you are interested in a couple of other uh, studies regarding the Tagos rock art, you can find it on ResearchGate uh, on my page and you're welcome to download anything you want. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Actually, I recognized, so by memory, I remember that we have here in the library of the Centro Camuno, we have the Archeos book with the a figura do servido na, na arte da, well, in Portuguese, my Portuguese is very bad, but the figure of the servid in the... In the the of Tagus, yes. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I remember we have that uh, that book here. So for those who, who are curious and pass by the, the center, they can they can have a look uh, of that uh, of that book, or they can go online and buy it online, <laughs> or they can have a look before buying. Exactly. Uh, no, they, of them. They, they Thank are... you very much. You you can what they are yeah, on they, uh, they are for free downloads. If uh, perfect, so, wants. so you have all the ways uh, that you want for for consulting them. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sara Garces. It was a, a very, very interesting presentation. Uh, I, I have to admit that I, I forgot about this uh, site. So thank you because uh, I have a, me, uh, a better understanding. And of course, all the people that, uh, that followed the, the presentation. Um, probably the, the, the first core, it's... Uh, uh, it's like uh, well, I studied more Paleolithic, so probably that's that's also why I, I knew less uh, about this one. Uh, so you have, um, of course, many people that are thanking you on, on Facebook. We have uh, one question that I'm reading you uh, right now. Um, so Arun is asking, uh, were there any effort from your side? Uh, to recreate uh, that art using natural stone tools on similar surfaces uh, in order to understand uh, how to do small image or a panel, etc., to understand the time, like to do it. Uh, so did, 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 do you have knowledge of some experiment uh, like that uh, concerning your area? Because... There are many areas? Uh, well, actually, actually, yes. Well, first of all, hello, Arun. <laughs> nice to, to see you again. Um, we did, uh, this was the concern of uh, a student that we had uh, some years ago that did a, a master dissertation on one of the sites of Tagus. And he was very interesting, interested in the technology of rock art. So there are there is actually a master dissertation from Nemir Santos de Rosa. I can uh, I can write down after the comment of Arun that makes um, a technological approach to the engravings of Tagus. He actually did experimentation. He explains all the process in the in the in the dissertation, and uh, we could actually um, make. Uh, similar figures with different tools, different times, uh, and he had very, very interesting considerations about that in the in the final uh, work. Um, and to give a more better idea of what time, what what type of tools people were using to do the rock art. So yes, there is at least one master dissertation and. Uh, um, uh, an article published, I think it's in my research gate too about that, and even did the PhD after in the technology of rock art regarding Levantine rock art. Um, so there are a couple of studies, but regarding Tagus, we 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 have that we have those that could be um, could be uh, used. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, so we have a question that uh, really pushes uh, your hermeneutic uh, approach. So let's see how you 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 read you you, you get it. So Peter asks for the figure of uh, uh, like the human figure holding up the sun. The sun has four rays. Uh, might that relate to the sun as an animal? like in the image of the anthropomorph holding the deer? Oh, no, maybe, oh, so I don't know the first figure, uh, which ah, is the first figure yes, Peter the first, refers to. Yeah, the first figure is uh, the one that it looks like it has the same one in the megalithic sites. Uh, remember this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
but uh, but he asked for the for figure of holding up the sun the sun has four rays might that relate to the sun as an animal like in the in image of the anthropomorph ah holding the deer sorry yes yes yeah. yes, yes well so, um yeah, so. the only thing i i think i can say is that the the anthropomorphic figures are very uh, similar the only difference that one holds a sun and the other a deer uh so the similar thing here is the the position and the act of holding something that is being replicated but yet with different figures which is very interesting uh, I don't know exactly, or obviously I, I cannot say exactly the meaning, but there are these kind of very unique things in Tagus that you can see in different sides. Very similar figures, but the meaning or the figure that could mean something is different. Uh, and also the, the fact that they close the handlers of the deer after to make a sun makes me think that in some time, uh, probably not hunter-gatherer societies, but later, the meaning of what was very important for them changed. Uh, and the sun comes here as a, a unique and important um, figure uh, because they are replicating figures from before, but with the sun, and they are adapting old figures to become a sun. Um, so this is very interesting. I don't know if the intention was to, instead of a sun, to look like a deer. I think the intention was to be a sun, but so the different, the meanings were changing. Uh, the myth probably was changing. The stories were changing and the importance they were, they were giving to things were changing too, I think. Well, if I, if I can also say something in general terms, so in general, terms because i don't i didn't study the, that area the the sun the importance uh, given to the sun uh, comes with the neolithic so with the agricultural um, activity where they knew like mathematically that the sun meant uh, uh, plants that meant life so like exactly. in general terms that the, the, the the symbology of the suns really has a big importance in that period so but uh, yes but uh, yeah yes yes that's true and exactly i i think in uh, um in uh, farmers and agriculture societies where the most important things uh, it's not uh, actually animals anymore they are important but not uh, only that they are adapting the the a figure to old representations. So using more or less the same uh, way of representing with, with the new meaning, with the new importance. Uh, and that is very, very interesting to see here. Yes, exactly. Well, uh, you know, we still do. Uh, uh, I like when we do parallels with our own culture because there are many things we are unconscious of in our culture. And, well, our culture, I mean, Western and broadly Christian uh, culture, because there are many cultures, of course, today. But, so in Christianity, we still have the dove, we still have the sheep. So we still have animal uh, connected to some symbology, you know? So, yes. And of course, it's something old that doesn't, we don't have sheep in our daily life. We don't see doves, if not with the magician that takes it from the... <laughs> So, so of it course, depends. The, the it tradition. depends. I still have sheep. I see a lot. Here. <laughs> yes, yes, of In the place I live, we still have a lot of sheep. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I had a, I had a question because um, uh, so you, you said now uh, most of the engravings are underwater, but so I had a question like now natural question is it still possible to go and see them like with the with the mask doing uh okay i will reply yeah this is a very good question because i have news for all of you well um well there are a few things i can say most there's a lot of the sites that no you cannot attend uh, there's we don't know very well uh, how high is the river there but we know it's a very deep part of the river I can say that in 2011, it was a year that didn't rain much in Portugal. And I, vis I visited one of the sites that was always underwater. And in that year, I could see engravings outside water. 
um, yeah so it was but it was a very because and, the water was down yes the water was really really down uh, i was not expecting that we went to the site to collect a sample of the schist to analyze and we saw a lot of engravings which was amazing but it didn't last long because as soon as the river went up to the normal level uh, it disappeared so we could see we saw engravings that were underwater for 40 years they were in a good conservation state uh, i can say but for me to see that in a, when the the water level goes down it means they were in a higher part of the river so i don't know the conservation state of figures that are really deep in the in the river so, um, so no one tried to go down with the with the mask with the, no uh diving in rivers especially between two dams i am pretty sure is really dangerous yeah. expensive yeah. and dangerous <laughs> uh yeah. but yeah. um we had a project this year called promuseus that was financed by the portuguese network of museums and taking the work that we did in Tagus with the, the recording, with the documentation, the drawings, the figures, everything, we managed to recreate in, um, in um, uh, virtual reality the ro some rocks of the Tagus. So right now, and we opened this new exhibition in the museum uh, a month ago, we can actually show the rock with the old deers and the horse, the one really old, the 155 of Fratel. We can show uh, a representation uh, of the environment uh, in the river and, and the rock itself um, in 3D with virtual glasses. So it's not the same, but 50 years after that rock going underwater, we can actually see it in virtual reality, uh, which is a big step yeah. because it, it actually, this was a trial. I mean, I, I consider it a trial project. It was a great project, still is. We have, we are working now in, in more rocks to, to recreate in 3D, but you gave us the chance to know that we can actually, with technology and the work that we did in Tagus, we can, who knows, recreate big part of the Tagus Valley and could be a tool for the sites that are now underwater, which in Portugal are a lot, um, but could be a very didactic and even research tool for the future. Of course. Do you have the documentation about the, the when they were doing the molds in the 70s? So do you have the exact orientation also, I imagine? Well, so uh, there's a part of the information that I, I yeah, yes, yes. I had, uh, I had access to, there. there is a part of that documentation that is published. So in the first uh, PhD uh, work that was published by the, the researcher that was there in the 70s, he didn't have all the rocks published, but some of, most of what he had had actually information about the orientation, inclination of the rocks. The, in the 80s or 90s, there were some topographic maps that were published I think two or three from different sides. So actually our work was picking pieces. Uh, Tagus were, is in pieces and we were picking all these pieces to try to get together as much as information as we could. So some rocks I know the inclination and the orientation. Uh, for example, this one that we recreated in 3D, we had a lot of information to work with. Some others, no. I know that they did uh, uh, field sheets, for example, but uh, because it's very old information, I, I didn't have access to that. Um, but we have some information regarding that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have another question from Peter, uh, which is asking, Azilian, uh, almost the Mesolithic, had the geometric art. So could some of the geometric art at Tagus be Mesolithic as well? Well, I don't think so, because Mes Azilian rock art, uh, which happens a lot also, for example, in Coa Valley, is also with a very specific characteristics and especially the technique. Scratch, very fine scratch. It has a very specific characteristics. 
The geometrics of Tagus are completely schematic rock art from the Neolithic. I can find it very, very good comparison. The technique is hard. It's really good uh, packed. And I can find comparison from all these images uh, in, in thousands of shelters um, around this territory. So I think, uh, obviously, this is uh, an interpretation, but I think that uh, the geometrics of Tagus are fully Neolithic, Calcolithic Bronze Age. OK. Uh, so thank you very much, Sara. Um, I don't know if you had to add something. Uh, we are very glad that you presented all this uh, material. Well, thank you for the invitation, Matteo. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to, to present for you and for the Centro. I hope I can visit you all soon again. Of course. I invite you, I invite you guys to come to Portugal and visit the museum and the 3D exhibition and the rock art of Ocreza that's still outside water. Um, and let me know if anybody needs my contact, please share. Uh, if you need anything from me, let me know. Yes, yes, you showed your, your email and of course you're also on Facebook. So once again, thank you very much, Sara. It has uh, been very appreciated, very complete the presentation of the Tagus Valley. Now we know better about that. Uh, so thank you and see you next time with, uh, with uh, all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.